Okay, let's, um, let's launch, all right? And so given everything that I just said, what I want you to remember is the things that you write down aren't as important as the things that you think about right now. Being able to report this information back isn't super useful. What I want is to be able to talk to you about this, and we're gonna do it on Monday during class. We'll prepare for it in a couple ways. One is the information that I'm about to present to you. The more important way that you're gonna prepare for it is by having conversations together after I'm done during class today, all right? So our, our topic is gonna to be DNA replication. The things that I want you to be able to talk about are the process of DNA replication. And for those of you who don't know this already, uh, to replicate something means to copy it. Okay, replicate means to copy perfectly. That's the duplicate, replicate, like replicate means you start with one thing, you end with two absolutely identical things. So that's what we're looking for when we, when we replicate DNA. And then I want you to be able to talk about why DNA replication is needed because like it's, it's essential for all living organisms. It has to happen for things to be able to be alive. And where it gets really interesting is how the structure of DNA, which is what we were looking at earlier this week with the models and with the, um, uh, and with the information that I presented you about DNA and the base pairs and all that, that is what determines how replication occurs. And if you think about it, it actually, like, it's a pretty tricky problem. How do you get a perfect copy of one molecule if there's no, like, in, like, there's no person doing it? It's not like an intelligent person being like, okay, we need this piece, now we need this piece, now we need this piece. So there's this, like, there's a, there is a non-thinking process that unfolds here. There's no director, there's nobody in charge, but it has to work perfectly. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, so the big picture here, two things that we're looking at. Number one, the, um, the, um, the function and the form of DNA are tied together inseparably. So the fact that um, DNA is a chemical and the fact that some of those chemicals stick together in a variety of ways, and the fact that those chemicals are, um, are um, located in the nucleus of the cell, all of that stuff is what determines how DNA works. So the structure of DNA is what determines its function. And all of this is part of what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. Molecular biology is basically DNA. Like when you talk about molecular bio biology, you're talking about DNA and genes and, you know, and stuff like that. And the central dogma essentially says a few things. One is that within cells, DNA is replicated or copied. This is necessary so that cells can reproduce. One cell divides into two. This might be reproduction of a living organism, like a bacteria that divides in two has reproduced. Or it might just be a single cell in a multicellular organism that divides to create a new cell. In a human being, if you cut yourself, new cells grow along the cut. And those new cells are identical to the ones that were there previously. They grow because the existing cells divide into two. That process is called replication. And then we're going to talk uh, next week about the other two parts of the central dogma. One is called transcription, where we have a working copy made of the genetic information in DNA. And the other is called translation, which is where we actually get proteins made. That process is called protein synthesis. Yeah? So the answer to that question is nobody understands that. Nobody. Nobody really understands fingerprints. We do not understand why we have the fingerprints that we have. There appears to be some environmental factor. Um, and some people think that it's actually present in utero. In other words, things that you're exposed to as a fetus can 
determine what your fingerprints look like. We don't understand why it is that, yeah, if you cut your finger, your fingerprint will come back just the way that it was before. We don't get it. Yeah, there's a lot we don't understand. Yeah? Do you think they could be for like bricks? Well, and so the answer to that is nobody really knows that either. We have a whole bunch of hypotheses about why we have fingerprints, including that it might increase grip, but we're not sure. We don't really know. Yeah? What does dogma mean? What does what? Dogma mean. Dogma means rule, like the, the like critical rule. So yeah, do, dogma is like a set of rules. And so these are the essential rules to um, molecular biology. All right, so um, DNA replication is what we're looking at now. So this is a process, and it is the process of creating two strands of DNA from where only one existed before. And it gets a little complicated because DNA um, often exists as the double helix, which is two strands that are already attached to each other. So when DNA replicates, what happens is we get a new copy of each one of these strands. And we go from one double-stranded piece of DNA to two double-stranded pieces of DNA. We don't go from one to two. We go from two pieces of DNA to four pieces of DNA. Two of these are attached. The other two are attached. They are identical to the original two strands, which were also attached to each other. Here's how it works. The first step is the double helix itself separates and kind of untwists. So we can see that DNA is twisted up here. As um, DNA is replicated, it has to untwist and those strands separate. That work is done by an enzyme. And remember, enzymes make chemical reactions happen more quickly. They regulate chemical reactions. So when you watch, um, in, in a few minutes, we're going to watch the Amoeba Sisters kind of go through this. And they're going to show this helicase enzyme as this little, like, like, cartoon creature. And that little cartoon creature has a brain, presumably, and eyes. And it's like, I'm going to take apart this DNA. And it like pulls it apart. And it, but that's not what really happens, of course. DNA helicase is an enzyme. It's one small molecule. It doesn't have a brain. It's a little tiny piece of protein. It's not a thing. It's not. A, I mean, it's not a living thing. It has no brain. It has no nerves. It doesn't even have cells of its own. It's inside your cells. That enzyme just reacts. That's all it does. It happens to be the right shape and made of the right stuff so that guonk, it sticks onto DNA, and then it causes that DNA to untwist and unzip. Doesn't do it because it wants to. It doesn't do it because it's alive. It doesn't do it because anybody tells it to. It does it because it's there. Those two things will always interact in that way when they're present in the right locations and in the right quantities. The next thing that happens after the DNA has um, unzipped from the, um, from the helicase enzyme is new base pairs get added to the existing strands of DNA. So we had one double strand, it separated. These two new, or sorry, these two strands now each have their own new strand attached to them. And those strands are built from nucleotides that are just floating around inside your, your cell's nucleus or inside the, the cell itself. So remember, a nucleotide consists of a, um, a phosphate group. Hang on, I have to get a good phosphate group here. A phosphate group attached to a sugar and a nitrogenous base attached to the sugar too. This is a nucleotide. Inside your cells right now, there are uncountable numbers of these things just floating around. Boop, 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 They're just floating around. And if they happen to get close enough to a single strand of DNA that's been unzipped, and the base pairs match, and 
the DNA polymerase enzyme is there, then, yoink, it will attach. That's how the new strands are built, from free nucleotides that are just floating around. And they follow the base pair rules because otherwise, chemically, they don't fit together. So if uh, there's a, an A on one of these strands, like if this piece right here is an A, and a G comes along, it won't attach. A C won't attach. They don't fit. The chemical ends don't stick together. But if a T comes along, then it will stick together, as long as the DNA polymerase enzyme is there. What does the DNA polymerase enzyme do? It just makes that more likely to happen. That's it. It speeds up that chemical reaction. These two things could attach on their own, but they probably won't. With the DNA polymerase enzyme there, they will are far more likely to happen. And physically, what happens is um, where did I put my? Physically, what happens is the DNA polymerase enzyme actually just holds the um, holds the uh, complementary bases close enough to each other so that they just attach. So that's really all it's doing is just pulling two things together. And as soon as you pull them together, then you get you get a um, chemical bond between them. Okay. So our uh, our anywhere there's an A in one of these original strands, it will pair with a T. Anywhere there's a C in one of the original strands, it will pair with a G. So it's predictable how these um, how these new strands will be filled. What that ends up doing over time, and it doesn't take long for this process to happen. What that ends up doing is using one of the existing strands and pairing a whole new set of nitrogenous bases to that that are then connected to each other to form a new strand. And on the other existing strand, the same thing happens. That means the two new strands that form are going to be identical to each other. And they're also going to be identical to the original double-stranded double helix of DNA. That's how replication occurs. And one of the things that's kind of cool to think about is that we're not taking one double helix, one double strand of DNA, and making a perfect copy of it. We're taking one, splitting it in half, and rebuilding on each of those original halves. So if you look at the strands, the separate single strands, each one of our new double helices has one old and one new strand. The gray color here indicates that part of the original double-stranded DNA, and the blue color is the new complementary strand that was formed on that. And you can see, because of the base pair rules, that over here, if this one had an A on the left and a T on the right, then our new one is going to have the A from the original strand over here match with a T that's new, and the T from the original strand match with an A that's new. This has an A and a T. This has an A and a T. The original had an A and a T. Because of those DNA base pair rules, because they chemically won't fit together with any other base, we know that our new double strands are going to be identical to each other and to the original double strand. Um, if we look at this, it, so this is just a different diagram, and I, I think it's a little bit easier to, to see what's going on here, but it's, it takes up more room, obviously. Here's our original double-stranded strand, double stranded DNA, and this right here is the helicase enzyme. Remember, it's not, as you'll see in just a minute, a little monster that like gobbles up DNA and causes it to split in half. It's a chemical. It's a chemical that reacts with DNA in such a way that it splits apart and spreads it out. DNA helicase has as much intelligence as rust. If you take a piece of metal and you leave it outside, it will rust. That's not because there's a little rust monster gobbling it up. It's just a chemical reaction that happens between water and iron. Um, these drawings show the original double helix of DNA separated into two strands. And you can now see over here, there are two 
DNA polymerase enzymes. One here operating on this original strand and one here operating on this original strand. And um, they, you'll see in the video, they actually move in opposite directions and we don't really care about that. It's kind of cool to think about that it's not something we care about in this class, but it turns out that one of these is gonna move away from the helicase and one of them has to move toward the helicase. The one that has to move toward the helicase gets a little bit complicated because it's gonna bump into the helicase. It gets a little weird, basically, is what's going on. The one that moves away from the helicase has a little bit of a better time of it. And then, um, um, ultimately, what you end up with are two replicates. These are copies of the original DNA, but each of them consists of one strand of new DNA that was added to one of the original old strands of DNA. So the key here is to see how the structure of DNA lends itself to this process. The fact that DNA isn't just a single strand, but it's two, and the fact that those two strands are complementary because of the chemical connections between the nitrogenous bases is why this works. When you split them apart, you have two strands that look on the surface completely different. But when you rebuild with complementary bases, you have to end up with two copies of what you started with. You have to, because chemically there's no other way to do it. I sometimes think of this in the old days. How many of you have used film cameras, like old school film cameras and developed it? Yeah. So we, we used to talk about this a lot, because in film, you take a picture and, and you make a negative, and then you develop the negative, and you get back what the original picture is. But, uh, but we don't use negatives anymore, so it's a little bit different. Things, things work a little bit differently. But if you're familiar with photography, that's kind of what it is. It's like, it's like a mirror image and then going back to the original again. All right. Uh, we're going to um, have the uh, Amoeba sisters talk us through this. And again, keep in mind that um, as, as the Amoeba sisters are talking, they are not, um, they're not portraying these things um, quite accurately. What they're showing you is a, just a way for you to sort of, it, it sort of um, makes it more accessible, but what you lose in their interpretation is the mechanistic nature of this. The fact that, um, that this entire process is simply a bunch of chemical reactions that happen to be happening at the right time because things are located in the right place at the right quantity. And that's it. There's no other piece to what's going on here, all right?